The concepts of Ibambo, Njepo, and Akonuche have propelled itinerant Igbo sons and daughters to venture beyond Nigeria's borders. Igbos are ubiquitous wherever the hustle is tangible and fruitful. Yet, what are the repercussions of this diaspora surge? As the Igbo adage goes, Ademenakiti, meaning one cannot labor in vain. Therefore, what motivates the nomadic existence and the how does this emigration impact the homeland? Additionally, we will examine the current political developments in Nigeria, including who is advocating for a national protest and who remains apathetic. We will also consider how significant political changes in France, Britain, and potentially the US might influence Nigeria. We will also talk about golf. Who plays golf? You never know. We'll find out. Because this is the Eastern Eye. I'm Alex Obodo. You're welcome to the Eastern Eye. Here at IFR TV, a program that x-rays the political, social, and economic developments around us. My guest tonight is Chief Ben Etiaba, FCA. Ifeni Anewi. As a Chief Wadalunu, fellow of the Ethical Leadership UN, and um, he joins me to this evening on the Eastern Eye. But you've been sending messages from your uh, recent uh, globe throat, and I, I, I tried to get this interview while you were abroad. He said, "Never mind. I'll, I'll soon be home." And you are here. You're welcome back. Thank uh, you. Thank Kenya. you, Alex. So the, the first thing will be: Will India will ever relent in their surgeon? for a better life, whatever that journey takes them. It's uh, difficult to see how they can relent. Uh, we are a very itinerant uh, tribe. We're like the Jews of Africa. Uh, you, you find the Jews scattered all over the world, and from there they can influence what happens in those host uh, countries and, and dictate the pace back home in Israel. So we're like that. We have a very, very small enclave in terms of the land, land space we have in the southeast. Uh, of course, Igbo land goes beyond the southeast, I'm sure you know that. But at least if we talk about generally the southeast, we don't have enough space to you know, sort of uh, contain all of us. And um, we don't have the economy, the size of the economy we need to run the place properly. So we need our people to um, work hard at home, uh, get things done at home, produce at home. But as much as that uh, is going on, uh, we also need our people in diaspora uh, to sort of uh, do whatever they are doing in the various places of our board and send the much-needed uh, hard currency, uh, the dollars and pounds and euros and all of that, back home to help sustain the economy back home. So, we, we, you know, anywhere you go in Africa, you, you'll see an Igbo man. Anywhere you go in Europe, in Asia, in, in, in America. So we need our people there. We don't want uh, all of us to be in sort of uh, in the southeast we want all of us to be interested in what is going on in the southeast develop the southeast make the southeast probably the, the number one uh, uh, zone in africa but at the same time to achieve that uh, you need to be almost everywhere uh, and uh, and they look uh, back and look inwards uh, to achieve that. that that's that's my take it's not a bad thing that we have our people scattered all over the world Great, uh, great to hear those words. And uh, you have also been traveling, not just to to holiday, you've been traveling, attending events organized by Ndibo in diaspora. In fact, one of such is near USA. I think it's called NUSA, uh, if, I, if I'm correct. So uh, it's a national convention of uh, NUSA. They called it Atlanta 2024. That's a beautiful city, by the way. Yeah. And... Um, uh, when you attend such gatherings and see the sheer number of Ndibo there and what they're doing, how do you feel being an Igbo man, having flown across the Atlantic and you are just part of your Keith and Keen out there? Uh, it is so wonderful to see our people in various countries that I, you know, in the last uh, three weeks I've been everywhere. Uh, I've been uh, in the United States, I've been in, in, in England and uh, I've been in, in Wales. So you see, uh, for various reasons, I mean, you, basically it's been a walking holiday for me. And our uh, people are doing so well uh, abroad that uh, you, you can only but feel proud uh, of, of what they are achieving. All our kids, you know, sort of uh, 
making the first class and distinctions in various higher institutions of learning. Um, and their parents obviously established, knowing that Nigeria is not working at the moment, and uh, coming back home is not their option. That's the way they look at it for now. I think differently. But uh, because they feel Nigeria is not working at the moment, they're trying to make the best uh, of their various uh, countries uh, of abode. So it makes me happy as uh, an Igbo person to see that things are working for our people there. But it's also, also, also I feel a bit sad that these guys feel trapped. They, don't, they want to come back home, but they can't. They feel just trapped there. Uh, but, you know, things are, things are happening. Uh, you talked about NUSA in Atlanta. I, I was the, uh, the chairman of the convention, and I also I gave the keynote address. It's usually uh, not common for one person to be the chairman of, of the convention and then be the keynote speaker. So it was a, a rare honor that was done to me, and, and I appreciate that. And one of the things I said to them, because we're all one, it doesn't matter where you reside, that this is the Nnewi one. I mean, I mean, when I was in London, it was the IFAC, the, all, all the Igbos. But the Nnewi one we were talking about, that Nnewi, they, we've not done badly as a, as a people. Uh, I predicted that, you know, that wasn't rocket science, that in the upcoming NBA, Nigeria Association election, that a Nnewi person will emerge, the president and, of NBA. And, and they emerged. And, and, they, and a Nnewi person emerged, the president <laughs> of NBA. But precisely because three of the candidates, all the candidates, all three of them were from Nnewi. So good things are happening abroad and even greater things also happening uh, uh, back at home. But when we, when we did the gala, we, then I was the chairman of the gala, like I said, it wasn't an Nnewi affair, it was an Igbo affair. You know, then it's open, it's a glamour night, you know, the one came, with, you know, uh, charity night too, it was ticketed. ticketed. And the, the, for the first time, the Nusa uh, gala night was sold out 48 hours to go to the event. It was sold and the demand was so much, they stopped collecting money on Thursday before the Saturday. So that made me happy uh, that we succeeded. And uh, I'm not saying it was down to me, but they organized well, uh, succeeded, Atlanta succeeded. In London, we had an even bigger event, uh, the IFAC, uh, the Festival of Arts and Culture uh, of Ndibo in, 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 in UK and Ireland. And that was awesome. That was awesome. You saw Igbo tradition at its best. You saw the best masquerades, the best dancers, and we're talking about adults, but kids, you know, at all, 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 every town union represented, you know, showcasing the best of their, of their towns, uh, various towns. So, I left uh, 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 UK on my way back, feeling that look, home is where you know, it's sort of where you are. It doesn't have to be you know within the the, the five states or, or more uh, that we have here. The people are doing so well. Like I said, they are not particularly happy to be there. I think they'd rather be home, um, but that's where they find themselves, and things are beginning to work, and they are having fun. Time waits for no one. Like I said in one of my posts, time waits for no one. So they are they're, they're not waiting for Nigeria to work. Uh, before enjoying their lives and uh, and um, you know sort of showing the, the Igbo culture to their children and uh, making sure things work for our people uh, in the Western world. I'm happy that you, you connected the story uh, of Britain. Uh, your your experience in uh, when you came back, uh, you you are sharing this experience with a lot of elation, which suggests that whatever you saw there it was something that really made you glad that you are an Igbo man. So when we bring this home, uh, there's always this perception that the moment someone travels and stays abroad for a couple of years or two or three years, that, that the person is now made. And well, he, I guess that having been there quite a, if you, you, you've, you've lived abroad and you travel quite often. There's a myth about people traveling abroad. There's also the real thing. Help us really deal with this, because there are people who think that the moment you jack back like mm. this, they put it, that you're all made, that it's, you just, it's just like leaving Nigeria and then you dive into a pool of money and then you start sending it home. Is it as easy as it is said? Okay, I always advise people that if you can um, make ends meet in Nigeria at home, three square meals and be able to pay your bills, school fees, medical bills and and relatively be, be comfortable, you have no business going abroad for, for economic reasons. It's actually easier here than it is uh, abroad. It's difficult to explain it to people. And a lot of our people go there and get stranded. Uh, it's not as rosy as uh, you may think. Uh, we have now a lot of charities, uh, our people, a lot of people coming together to feed 
those ones that jump out from here but are trapped uh, in, in the Western world because they cannot feed themselves. It's, it is very, 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 very bad. While, while I was there, uh, I was made to understand that the High Commission, the, that's the Nigeria Embassy in, 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 in UK, in London, um, had various meetings uh, on trying to deal with this issue. It's a major issue there. A lot of families sold everything they had uh, before in Nigeria, only to get to the UK to find that you know, they, it's not like they, they had imagined. And they are struggling. Uh, so please, I will just say to anybody, if you, if you can live here, if you can survive in Nigeria, no need to take that risk. That's the first one. The second one is that you find that a lot of our people there are also exploiting their own people. You know, they give you a bill to pay, to bring you over, and then your life is sorted. And then you get there, you find that, okay, you've paid them, but and then you're in England or wherever it is in the States. They are gone. They, you know, their transaction is finished with you, and you're stranded. So please, don't do that. You know, try and survive here. A lot of our people abroad want to come back, like I said. The only problem they have is that what the people here have and are not appreciating, they don't have. They, they have nothing to come back to. So that's why they are not coming back. Stay away unless you have a good reason to be there and you have, uh, maybe you're going to further your studies and, uh, or whatever. But it, it's not worth it. That's, that's what I say. No, it's not like that. It's not that rosy. So the, yeah. the, the tripodal concept applies to he who needs it most, the concept of Iban Bonjepo and Akonuche. Is there a way, you know, people can actually understand this? It's, that it's not about traveling. It's about having something you're traveling for and about. You mentioned going to school, which looks like some of one of the shortest routes people use in traveling to uh, wherever it is they want to travel to education in search of higher education yeah. or better education. I always say that uh, I will uh, all the time encourage people who want to venture out uh, to improve on their worldview. We all need to have great worldviews and that's the only way we can improve society generally. Um, but to do that, you must have something that is taking you there, not just to you know, sort of uh, go hoping that things will be rosy, okay? Now, education you're talking about, it is not so easy to go now and study abroad because people are hoping that, okay, so long as I can get myself there, pay the first set of school fees, maybe the first year, I can now begin to work and now pay my way through. And then you get there and find that even British citizens themselves don't have enough work. So where are you going to get the work? Uh, the, the jobs to you know enable you so you know we have a lot of our people stranded and you talked about picking money off the trees in in the western world it's not like that at all the money you see people come back with after a year or two or even six months those are i call it dirty money uh, money that uh, that are obtained fraudulently okay it is so difficult to make money in the Western world. I mean, it is far too difficult. The system is so regimented that whatever you earn there goes back to, to taxes and paying your bills. At the end of the day, you have not much left. People who are earning honest living and are able to come back maybe once a year, holiday, bring their children. By the way, it's very difficult to pay tickets, pay for your kids to come if you want to bring your family home once a year or whatever. I used to do it when I was in England, but it was very difficult. Only a few people could afford that, okay? But the people who do that actually have to take bank loans to buy those tickets, okay? Bank loans to have, uh, you know, some extra money to spend. And when you get back, you have to repay the loan. So it is not as easy as that. And we are here putting pressure on them to send money. Quite a lot of them are actually there hoping that they'll get some money from, from here to be able to survive. It is not, a, the Western world is not as, uh, you know, as free as, as it used to be. Things have changed. COVID changed a lot of things. If you're talking about Britain, for instance, that I know too well, Brexit finished Britain. You know, it's better to survive in Enugu than it is to survive in London. Easier to survive in Enugu than it is to survive in London. I can tell you that. Mm. I wonder if someone who's planning to travel now is listening to that, but who knows? But Nigeria is in dire straits, and there are calls uh, for protests. And you already know that the federal government are pointing accusing fingers at the likes of uh, P2B and even Professor... Um, uh, 
uh, I don't know why I forgot his name just for a bit. Chidi, I think. No, no, not Chidi. Oh, okay. uh, uh, well, I remember. Well, Chidi is yeah, my friend, so, I hope it's yeah, not him. No, so, uh, there, there's that back and forth about whether Nigeria should go the way Kenya, Kenya youths uh, decided to go. And when you look at the whole mix, they say Nigeria is not Kenya. Our problem and that of Kenya is not the same. So, will a protest solve Nigeria's problem? If people empty to the streets and start, and probably the, the thing goes, goes south and they start breaking and burning things, will that solve the problem? Okay. Let me bring it down to the southeast. Onya Julada Juomwe, okay? You mentioned about uh, people being accused, and I don't know who the other prop is, uh, of uh, inciting this. And, of course, Nigerians know that this has absolutely nothing to do with Pitoli. I mean, even from the north, they're saying mm. it, from the southwest, they're saying it, nothing to do with Pitoli. And they are messing themselves up by uh, trying to link uh, Pitoli to, to, to the protests. It's not Pitoli that has made things difficult in Nigeria, okay? Uh, he's not even in, in a sort of the, the in gov in government now, so you cannot say he, any of his policies or, or implementation uh, has put us where we are. So. Let's put him out of the way, sort of remove him from there. Uh, but I'll go beyond that and, and go to even the bigger picture of the Southeast. What I will say is that whether or not protest will, 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 will solve Nigeria's problem, I say this and I appeal to the people of the Southeast please stay away from any protest looming. Because at the end of the day, you will be the scapegoats. That's the first one. The second one is that if Nigeria has decided that you're not going to be a part of the process of solving the problems we have, why are you protesting when things are going on? Let the same people who believe that the Southeast should not be a part of solving Nigeria's problem deal with the problem. It's as simple as that. So please, I'll say to our people, keep away from this. Keep away from it. Uh, we have no business being a part of any protest because at the end of the day, We'll be no. scapegoated. Mm. All right. I mean, I, it, it, it's quite lovely listening to uh, you say this because a lot of people uh, seem to think that Professor Pat Utomi, that's, that's uh, the man I was, uh, and he had to issue a rebuttal saying that he's currently on, uh, is in the U.S., you know, doing something really, really busy for him. Is uh, you know, you have, it, it, yeah, I mean, he issued it and said that, well, uh, we we'll, will not belabor that, and uh, if any has uh, say, said his own, that uh, uh, protest at your own peril, isn't it? Exactly. Okay. Let's keep away from it. So, we'll look at Nigeria again. There's still a lot of high cost of food. They're talking about um, palliatives. Where government says we've sent trucks to your states, and some states say we haven't gotten any trucks. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of talk going on everywhere that... What happens to the palliatives? We don't know what happens to the palliatives. But let's come back to the southeast. Is that something the southeast can do as a region, other than just wait for what the federal government can do for her? Okay, uh, I'm one of those uh, who no longer shout about uh, marginalization of the southeast. I don't waste time talking about it. But I am of the opinion now that the southeast should come together and solve our problems. We cannot wait wait for the man from Damatru, or from Katsina, or from Obomasho to come and solve the problems here. And there's no reason why our governors cannot come together, okay? Develop policies and craft a vision that will help us deal with the issues bedeviling us. If it is agriculture, don't we have land? Why are we waiting for food to come from the north? We have land that we're not cultivating, okay? Very, pretty much most things happening in, in Africa, in, in Nigeria, um, rely on government policies and government funding and, and, and sources like that. Okay, so why can we not come up with a solid plan for agriculture? Obara did it in the sixties. Obara used agriculture, okay, to take the economy of the eastern region, big even bigger than the southeast, to be one of the fastest growing economies of the world. So if he could do it then, by nineteen sixty four. This, the Eastern region was already rated globally as one of the fastest growing economies of the world at the time. Within four years, he was able to. So if he could do this, 
hey, in today's age, with the great world, with better worldview, better information access, better technology, great sources of funding, why can't we do better? So, I'm not of the view that we should continue waiting for Nigeria to come and solve our problem. We can, we have the gift, we have it within us to find solutions. If it is human capacity, well, the South East has it in abundance. Okay, what is it? If it is funding and money, finance, we can we can come up, you know, match any any zone. So what is holding us back? We have it within our gift to solve our problems. But what we what we find is that everybody is doing their own stuff. Abia is doing stand alone. Imo is doing stand alone. Anambra, Enugu, and all that. Come together. Find some synergy. Come up with. Set up a good economic team, a good uh, a committee that can come up with the right ways of doing. I have a friend. I mentioned the Chidi uh, Okay Odinkalu earlier. We both agreed on on, on on what I'm saying now that we should solve our own problems and stop screaming about marginalization. I'm tired of that, you know, hearing that. We can solve our problems. Mm. We can solve our problems. And talking about solving our problems, there are places that what they do there affect what we do here. Yes. And, and whether we can solve those problems for ourselves. I'm speaking of international politics. Things are heating up in France, Britain, and the US. Let's start from France, where uh, the situation there a little to the right and a little to the left. Uh, things seem to be just standing still in France. I think they are waiting for the Olympics to, to pass so that they know whether they, they are tilting to the left or to the right. With what has happened in France, for instance, what do you think is the message for French people? Because it looks like when Marie Le Pen thought she was going to grab it and take it to the left, it looked like some people went and campaigned overnight and said, okay, we can't let her take this. She's too extreme. What do you think happened in France, that they just snatched it? Just when Marie Le Pen thought that her time has come. Okay, you know, the Western world, and they, they have their issues. They have their problems. And they always know how to come good, how to solve their internal uh, problems. And they always are bring it back to Africa, because we're more interested in what's happening in Africa than what's happening in Paris. They always see Africa as the source of their raw materials. Okay? They come here, grab it, snatch it, and go back and develop their place. And they are, of course, attacking the left because of the wave of coups in Africa. There's this resurgence of right-wing politics. In, 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 in France, because they feel that, uh, that uh, the, the Macron is weak and has let Africa uh, sort of try to free itself. Okay? So I would say to France, because go and stew in your own stew and juice. I'm not interested in what's going on there. Let's go, back, let's go even to Britain, because you are going to go to Britain next. In Britain, the Labour Party just won a resounding election. And what led to that? You had the Conservatives in office for, I think, about 14 years, okay? In 14 years, they were more interested in their own infighting, in their own political party, okay? In their own internal cohesion of the party, not the, of the country. And in trying to save their party, they took, they made Britain the sick man of Europe by calling my good friend, I'll say my friend, not most humbly, David Cameron, called a Brexit election that he thought he was going to, everybody thought he was going to win. Okay, to stay in, in Europe, and they lost. And since then, everything has gone down here. They, 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 they voted to leave Europe because they were tired of Europeans like them coming to take jobs and lord it over them in, 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 in Britain. And by freeing themselves, they thought, of Europe, what they end up with? An Indian prime minister, a Muslim mayor, and Muslims, you know, sort of taking over everywhere. There's nothing wrong with Islam. I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but that's their headache. If there is, it's their headache. But the point I'm making is that in trying to hurt others, you end up inflicting wounds on yourself, self-inflicted wounds. So I'm not interested in what they are going through. They don't stew in it. They don't particularly like us. I hope you know that. They don't particularly like us. So. 
um, if, 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 if by things not working well in Europe and them fighting themselves in there, we're able to free ourselves to be able to do what we're doing here for ourselves. All good. But what do you think, how do you think things will shape up with Keith Stammer in charge? Or will it be just reinforcing what was there? You see, what happened in Britain and with Keith Stammer, um, Keith, Stammer, Keith Stammer actually went to see my brother uh, last year with uh, the deputy, uh, his uh, deputy prime minister. But I have a very beautiful picture. He visited my younger brother in his office, three doors away from where my own practice used to locate him along Jamaica Road in London. And my brother is not in politics in UK. But he was serious enough about winning the election as far back as last year that he knew that there were people who could influence the ethnic minority. And my brother was one of them. Uh, that's Henry. Um, now, with Kistama, the beauty of democracy is that you have ideology. In Nigeria, there is no political ideology. All the parties are the same. If anybody tells you Labour Party is different to APC, to PDP, please don't say that to me. I've been an active participant, and I hope you know that. So I've seen them all. They're all the same. The only difference lies will always be in the individual candidates. Okay? They make the difference. If Buhari, say for instance, is the leader of APC, APC the party will wear the toga of Buhari. If it is Tinubu, the same thing. If Atiku is leading PDP, so it is the individual candidates. If Pitobi is in Labour Party, Labour Party all of a sudden will become the, 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 the party smelling of roses in Nigeria. So it is the, the candidates that make the difference. And now, the beauty of democracy in the Western world, where democracy is actually practiced the right way, is that they have ideologies, okay? So we, and they get tired every so often with one political party, and they move to the other one, and it's good for democracy. When one party has been in office for 14 years, what do you think will happen? They become complacent, they become arrogant, they begin to ride a rough shot against, uh, on, against the masses. So with kids that are coming in now, you're going to find that a lot of the ills of the last 14 years will be corrected. But if it's there for a long time again, new problems will come up that will need to be addressed and they'll swing the other way. An example, look at what happens in America. America will always gravitate between the, um, uh, uh, the, the Democrats and, and the Republicans. Yes, we will, we will yeah. come to America because yeah. we are due for a break. Okay. When we'll come back, we'll move across the Atlantic and get all the gist from there. This is the Eastern Eye. We'll be back after this break. Stay with us. <music> You're welcome back to the Eastern Eye here on Afia TV. It's a program that X-rays the political, social, and economic developments around us. My name is Alex Oboda. I say have in the studio with me, Chief Ben Atiaba, FCA, Ifenia Anambra. Thank you so much for joining me after your very grueling golf game. But we'll come to that golf much later on the program. So, President Biden has decided to walk away from the presidential race and has endorsed Kamala Harris, his vice president, to try and pick up the Democratic uh, Party's nomination as presidential candidate. Did you see that coming? Um, I'll say I saw it coming, and I'm sure you did. <clears throat> it's very difficult uh, to, to think that a man who can hardly recognize his friends anymore will be left to be the candidate of a major political party like the Democratic Party in America, okay? Biden was always one of the most brilliant politicians over the years in the States. But he's a human being, and, you know, age has caught up with him, okay? Life has caught up with him. And, you know, being president is not a tea party. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a big job. Uh, it's a lot of stress. And to think that a man uh, who is no longer as strong as... I mean, Trump is it's not, actually not much to do with age because Trump is not much younger, but Trump is still, you know, sort of uh, more uh, coordinated than him. So you find that the state, uh, physically, that you find, uh, and uh, mentally and health-wise, uh, the, the president, it shouldn't really... It would be too much stress expecting him to go, you know, for another uh, four, four years. Uh, uh, well, except if you're hoping that he'll win the election and step aside for... For, for, for the VP to now become the president. So, but um, no, I think he did the right thing. Uh, most people saw it coming. Uh, when not rocket science, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so how, how do you see that panning out uh, out there in the US? Uh, a lot of people are saying, because after the assassination attempt on Trump, they 
Republican Party sort of got all the attention for almost one whole week before uh, President Biden dropped the bombshell. Well, do you think that has changed the, the, the concentration for now? Okay, the it's, attention? Very, it's very difficult for me to sit in the studios in Enugu and tell you and be, become a political pundit uh, and uh, tell you what uh, the pundits in, uh, you know, what's going to, going to happen uh, in the States. But my personal view is this. I was in Atlanta uh, just two weeks ago or so, and I was shocked that even our people, the blacks in Atlanta, Nigerians in the Igbo in Atlanta, who usually are die-hard Democrats, all of them, almost all of them, were now planning to vote for, for, for Trump. Okay? And I couldn't, couldn't understand it. You know, my, my issue is, if you don't like Biden, why don't you, you know, sort of close your nose and vote for him anyway, knowing that there's a chance that he will be getting a black uh, a female uh, American president for the first time. And they don't care about that. But you see, the Democrats, the blacks have traditionally always voted for Democrats in America. Just like in, in Britain, blacks have always voted for the Labour Party in Britain, largely. It's only recently that you find black people in, 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 in the Conservative Party in the UK. So now, uh, 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 the, 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 the Republican Party uh, usually will have just a few token black faces and but things are changing obviously as the war as the last as the, the world evolves but the issue is that look we've always supported the democratic party over the years what have we gotten to show for it was it not the same democratic party that came and messed up nigeria's election in 2015 obama did in 2015 okay Nigerians have not forgotten that. I mean, so I mean, Nigerians of this particular, if you know what I mean, have not forgotten that. Now, the same uh, 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 Democratic Party, ha they championed, and why did they even hate Jonathan? I hope you remember why they hated Jonathan. Because Jonathan refused to sign the LGBTQ uh, uh, legislation. He refused blatantly. And they possibly, almost possibly, removed him. Okay, And they have, that's what they have done, also done in the United States. So, People, and you know our people are conservative uh, in our thinking, the way we raise our fa family values and all of that. So that's a major issue for them. And Trump is telling them what they want to hear. He's anti that, anti this, anti that. My personal opinion remains not for, for this space. I'm not here to criticize or attack anybody. But I'm telling you that our people believe in strong family values. Okay, So Trump uh, already was doing much better and, you know, with the black votes was going to do much better. So, but with Biden stepping aside, and it's looking more likely than not that uh, Harris may be the, the candidate, and that makes sense, a lot of sense anyway. Uh, it may begin to now sway, persuade, you know, our people to uh, the blacks to now you know, sort of uh, come back home, uh, so to speak. And I dare I say this: if there's ever a America, I'm not sure uh, they're quite ready for a female president. My mother, till tomorrow, remains the only female uh, governor in Nigeria. So I'm not against women being in positions of authority and leading. America is not quite ready for it. But if there's ever a time that is ripe for this to happen, it is now. Because Trump is a very vulnerable candidate. Mm. I mean, that's a very robust way to put it. And uh, a lot of people are already saying, because when uh, Kamala Harris... Uh, the first statement she put out, she they say she was graceful. She didn't sound triumphant. She just said that she will work hard and earn the nomination of the Democratic Party. So, how, how do you rate her reaction so far? And uh, some of the endorsements have been quite conservative too. Uh, Obama, they say, is the rock star of the Democratic Party, so he's holding back his endorsement until after the convention. So how, how do you think it will pan out? Do you think that eventually they will have to stand behind her? Because already the, the Biden campaign has got a lot of money already uh, raised. So if anyone emerges, the person will have to negotiate with the donors on whether they want to move the money to his campaign or her campaign. But do you believe that uh, Kamala Harris will take this? I, I believe she will be the nominee at the convention. Uh, I believe that she will be the candidate uh, of the Democratic Party. And don't forget that the funds raised, uh, those funds uh, were meant for the Biden-Harris Harris 
team campaign. So she has a stake in that money. I don't think it will be difficult to persuade the donors to shift it that way. By the way, more donors will come now because a lot of quite, quite a lot of the traditional Democratic Party donors were holding back their funds uh, because they, you know, they weren't they sure. They wanted Biden not, out. They wanted Biden now. Now that uh, seems to be a, a breath of fresh air. I think it is time to uh, uh, um, that they, they, they will come good and fund the campaign. Don't forget this the fact the fact that uh, Kamala had already ran for president before. She's not a greenhorn. She ran against Biden, and it was her performance. Uh, during that primary, uh, that uh, got her the, the VP uh, picks uh, at the time. So she's not a greenhorn. She knows her onions. She knows what to do. What she needs to find is a redneck, white uh, Democrat, okay, who will be an attack dog to sort of go after Trump. She must remain presidential and stay away from the fray, okay? Eyes on the ball. Econ on and do it, Better people to do it. Mm. So, how would uh, whatever happens in the U.S. in November probably affect Nigeria, the rest of Africa? You see, the world is a global village now, and uh, uh, you cannot say that um, uh, we can be an isolated case. Uh, but you have to understand, too, uh, that if we know what we're doing, we can stand our ground and say we cannot be pushed around. Okay? Look at what happened uh, when uh, um, the president of Nigeria almost, well, believe, we believe, was given the marching orders to go and attack the Nigerian Republic. Did he do that? No, he did not. So you don't have to because the world Western powers are there, uh, kowtow to um, uh, their dictates. Uh -huh. So whatever happens, they have their country to run, they have their foreign policies, which may not change much anyway, whoever is in the White House. But we have our own country to run. If we know what we're doing and if we're confident enough about it, we can, we can survive. Mm. Yeah. All right, let's talk about golf. It's about the second EGC match play golf tournament. And uh, you were not in the country when it started. And FATV has been reporting robustly on, on the ECG uh, golf tournament. Um, you were on the golf course this afternoon, and uh, the much publicized uh, match play you had uh, with the captain, that's you there in the picture, uh, marching stoutly on the course, lush green course, I must say. And um, let, let's find out uh, how you felt about the match. I think there was, there was uh, let, let's listen to your interview now. And if uh, Tobago can roll that, or Dan Larry, uh, we're just seeing some of the highlights. And um, I enjoyed myself, I enjoyed the game, I believe he did as well. And um, we ran the course. The game uh, ended uh, uh, slightly later than it was expected uh, to end. Uh, he was gracious to allow me to get to hole 15 <laughs> before I surrendered uh, with three holes to go. So um, each captain has done well. They've built on, I built on what I met on ground and they've done the same thing. But what I like about the, the captain, the, the current captain we have, I call him the great captain, uh, is because um, he is not just doing infrastructure, but he's like adding software to the hardware we have already. So you find that more people are turning up, more interested in what's going on, more members joining and uh, the place is bubbling. But above all, we're here to make friends and enjoy ourselves. We're not going to play, we're not professionals, so we're not playing to make money. We're playing to enjoy ourselves, keep fit. My opponent was the former captain. He was former captain over 10 years ago, so you can imagine. And uh, he once played had the captain team, even though today, because of business and because of uh, so much engagement, he's playing 16. But uh, it proved to be a very tough uh, game for me. It was a very tough game. I never actually uh, took it for granted. But, uh, we have a lot of spectators, a lot of people coming around. Uh, today, ordinarily, it's uh, supposed to be a busy day. Um, but on the course here, you know, you see a lot of people around, all waiting to see the results of the games on going you know. I mean, that was uh, the experience at the golf course. That, that was the, the, the captain there, the current captain and the former captain. Uh, I mean, you, you started hyping this, this golf game, even while you were still abroad. And uh, we sort of looked forward to it. When the, the, the camera crew came back and I was like, who won? Who won? <laughs> and he, he paused and told me, oh, uh, yeah, the, the captain won. I said, well, he was jet lagged. <laughs> That's why I would put it. Were you jet lagged or was it, it was meant to be that way? 
actually, I don't want to make excuses uh, for what happened. They, I, I was right in my mm. prediction. Mm. I predicted that the captain was going to win, and the captain won. But I was wrong in my prediction somehow, because I thought he was going to have an easier win. Okay. But it was not easy for him. I pushed him all the way to hole 15. But I had to concede that uh, uh, at hole 15, because by then, there was no way I was going to defeat mm. him. So by the time we got to 15, we both tied gross on that hole. And that meant that even if I won the remaining three holes, he was I still going to win. Catch so I conceded. Okay. Mm. Was I jet lagged? Yes, of course. I, you know, my schedule was very grueling. Yeah. It was very grueling uh, in, the, in those 18 days. Even when I came back to Nigeria, I've been, I've been following yeah. my activities. So, but that's not an excuse. The course is the captain's course. I mean, I was captain 10 years ago. It's a long time ago. Uh, the course is the captain's course. We have a wonderful captain uh, in Austin, Honor. Uh, he's a gentleman. Um, I enjoyed my game with him today. It's always a pleasure and the privilege to play with the captain of the day. And um, he's you know, sort of running, running down his second term. So by next year, we'll elect a new captain. And I have every kind word for him. Uh, because as a former captain, it, you know, it makes me happy to see uh, that my successors are building on what they met on ground. Each one of them doing well. But this one, Honor, is a great captain. Mm. So talk to us about this. Uh second ECG match play golf tournament. For a lot of people who don't quite understand the game of golf, it, number one, it's elitist. There's no need denying that golf is an elitist game, even to buy whatever it is you use. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a game for people who are still struggling for subsistence earnings. It, it's, it's a game of people who, are, who, who know where their next meal will come from. So how do you connect with people who don't know about golf? How will this benefit someone who's watching and wants to know really more about golf and how would that benefit the person? Okay, I always don't like when I'm asked a question during interviews and I'll say, that's a good question. But I'll say, that's a fantastic question you asked. You'll notice that um, I have actually gone out of my way to hype this game and to promote the game of golf. Yes. The reason why I do that uh, isn't to tell people that I play golf and I enjoy it. No. I'm doing it to encourage more people in the Southeast to play this beautiful game of golf. Because we tend to forget that golf is great for leadership. Uh, golf is great for followership. Golf is good for business. It's good, great for your health. It's good for networking. And if you think about this, you don't need to promote football. Our people understand football. Okay, but they don't understand the game of golf. And yes, it appears to be elitist. But the fact is that if you show interest in the game of golf, uh, and you're good at it, and you're committed to playing it, you have enough. Well, I give personally, I'm not a man of money, means like most people that know me know that that's, that's never been my strength. But there's hardly a year in the last 20 years that I don't give out a golf bag with full bag to potential players to come in and play the game, to encourage them to come. So long as you're interested in the game, there's always somebody who will sponsor you. So is it elitist? I don't know. I know I play it. <laughs> but is it for, for the well-off? You must you be rich to play? No. Come to me. There are many people like me who will help you to get into the game, help you to play the game. We need to... Why do you think in Nigeria we don't have a Tiger Woods? We've never produced any golfer in the top yes, I, 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 I was coming to ask you yes. who your golf mentor is. Is it Tiger Woods? Is he Lee Westwood? No. Is he uh, any of those guys? All of the above is what I will say. And of course, because Tiger was the first black superstar, a golf superstar, so everybody likes Tiger. I have a lot of his books. And if you read, just play that. Okay? But all of the above, just golf is not... Uh, should not be a racist game. It is not. It, it's a game where you go to prove yourself. I don't care if you're white or black or brown or whatever. No. If you're good, you're good. Okay? Nobody. So, um, I, I, just like I say, people like Tiger, you've mentioned, uh, I am the hero of many people locally here, okay, who want to follow the game. I've done many golf videos, and I do those things to encourage our people of the Southeast to play the game. If you go to Lagos, you have the great clubs like Ikoi Club, uh, Ikeja Club, 
most of the players there and captains there, former captains, Mbibo. But the game is dying in the Southeast, or not even, people are not aware of it in the Southeast. If you go to IDB, you have the likes of Imano Sike, captain, you know, Mbibo, you know, uh, uh, um, and he had go to San Diego, uh, a member of the Board of Trustees when he was alive, uh, um, Ide Omonia. Uh, Menaka, Dr. Menaka, currently trustee of IBB, but we are not actually doing much, you know, to, to harness the game in the Southeast. That's my passion, to tell our people that this game can be serious business, you can make money playing it, and you can dedicate yourself to the, high, to the highest peak playing the game, okay? I'm glad that if you come to Anambra now, for the first time, we'll have a, a golf course that is working. Obi Jackson has done a wonderful one in Okija. I'll be playing that course this December. Uh, if you go to Unisic, one is being developed now. So, you know, but Enugu has always been good uh, because, you know, the colonial masters were here. Uh, Enugu Sports Club that I was chairman of was set up in 1929. The golf course was set up, okay? And luckily, you know, we've lost some land there, but it, life's still there. So it's a beautiful golf course. A boy, uh, Fergabon, you know, sort of a, a developed one. Uh, Imo State, the army developed one at Obize. Um, I think Abba has always been there again. The colonial masters did it. So, we are not doing too bad, but we want to do more courses and encourage our people to play golf. So I post all those things to encourage our people to get into the game. I mean, I, I, I love golf, but after listening to you, I think I, I, I'm liking golf some more. I'm yeah, getting a lot of, based on that, yeah, a lot of people yeah, are saying that good, they will play. You've been a good salesman I for golf. To, I try to. Maybe you just won yourself a new player. Thank you. All right. And um, that's a good way to end it. You, we teed it off with uh, something different and finally... We ended on a very light-hearted um, golf note. Thank you so much, Chief Ben Etiaba. Thank you. FCA, Ifenia, Newi. Thank you so much for you. talking to us tonight on the Eastern Eye. Thank you, Alex. And uh, before you. we go, just a few seconds. Okay. I want to get a plug in for uh, Zespronet. Okay. as a charity set up by uh, our mama, sort of uh, as our alma mater of Abia State University. Uh, you know, I gave a keynote as, uh, address over dinner address over the weekend and they are doing so much for charity for Abia state for climate change in the southeast and helping each other and giving back to society zest for it i'll say more maybe in a different uh, program about them Good. but i'm proud of them thank you so much and that's the eastern eye for tonight up next is nka with rochelle my name is alex awodo good night mm -hmm.